I feel like an actor. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a pleasure to me, it's a great, yes. It's a pleasure to me to present uh, the first last Ignatian seminar of this year. So our speaker is the founder in the Max section, is Alberto Belkowski from Mexico, and he will talk about the Pancaredis and non empyrean geometry. Well, thank you very much. I feel very honored to be invited to this uh, uh, talk on basic notions. I thank the mathematics part section. So I will speak about basic notions, and of course, one of the most basic notions starts with Euclid, 300 years before Christ, with Euclidean geometry, the founder of Euclidean geometry. And in fact, the, the notion of basic notions is in fact born with the Greeks. The notion of postulates, axioms, theorems, etc. So it's, I think it's very appropriate to, I think I choose the, the right uh, uh, topic. So, yeah, so Euclid created a series of postulates, uh, axioms, with which you create Euclidean geometry. And uh, in fact, you don't need to know what Euclidean geometry is, you can play with it. So let me give you a metaphor. The metaphor is the, is the game of chess. You can play chess without having a precise definition of chess. Because no matter what definition you give me of chess, I can give you a, another way. Say, well, it's a square, eight by eight, with black and white. I say, no, no, they are red and green. So it doesn't matter the things you can play, and, and uh, that's the way it's, it goes with Euclidean geometry. But in fact, there's a model, it's a universe, in which you can play the game. And that, universe is the Euclidean plane, R2, provided with usual coordinates, x, y, and provided with a natural, a usual, a standard distance, and this beautiful object has the property that is homogeneous with respect to a group, is the group of Euclidean motions, that precedes the orientation, which are of the form a rotation. Well, let me write this up. Let me write it also as, can, can be written as column vectors. I like to write them as that. So, xy goes to cosine theta, sine theta. So, this transformation, as you know, is a rotation of angle theta. And also, you have translations, and so you have the group of composition, of translations and rotation, and that's called the Euclidean uh, motions, the rigid motions of the plane, and is SO2, well, it's, a, it's written in this fancy way, semi direct product of the orthogonal group and R2, and according to a, to a famous uh, German mathematician, Felix Klein, He gives a bet. 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 He and it has in a beautiful way. You can go from any point to any point by a rigid motion, and you can go from any direction to any other direction. There's a rigid motion that takes this vector to that one, so you translate and then rotate, and it acts like that. So, but without further delay, let me explain what the title of my talk, which is the Poincaré disk. Well, the first place, the Poincaré disk was not created by Poincaré. It was actually created by the Italian, Eugenio Beltrami. And, uh, but what is important is that Henri Poincaré is one of my heroes. He was born in Nancy and died in Paris. Uh, 
the use he made of the Poincaré disc is what makes fantastic. Because, as you will see, it's a combination of complex geometry, hyperbolic geometry, number theory, group theory. The whole world enters into one object. And it's an amazing object. So without further delay, let me tell you what the Poincaré is. So in the first place, we can always identify the plane, Euclidean plane, with the complex numbers by the usual rule. So we can think respectively either the plane or the plane provided with a complex structure named C. And in this in this C, you, you know the things that you have taken in your school, complex conjugation, the, the absolute value of a complex vector, how to multiply is a field, how to add, etc. And you take the unit disk consisting of all call it delta consists of all complex numbers such that its norm is less than 1. So it's an open disk. So what's, <laughs> I mean, what's a great invention? It's because this disk is not only a disk, it's provided with a beautiful metric, which I will describe. It's described by the following. The S, and I explain all the notation. Can you write a little bit bigger for us? Uh, Excuse me? Can you write a little bit bigger for us? Yeah, okay. Bigger? Write bigger? A little bit, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this incomplex notation is simply written as dz squared and what this means is the line element and we, one is in, at the university, of, you know, you don't understand exactly this notation and this notation is actually due to another great mathematician, Gauss You see, one seven seven seven. Okay, and when we see this, this notation, this notation is a particular case of a general notation invented by Gauss or described by Gauss. Is the following: he describes S two. So you take a region on the plane. So I take an open, let's say open connected set of the plane, non standard connected. Take an open set of the plane, and Consider the following expression. Of course, I'm defining a Riemannian metric of the plane, but I, let me explain it a little. So what is that? I see what's, what's that? There are many young people that, of course, most people know what it is, but sometimes this is supposed to be elementary. So this means simply the following for each point x, y on the region, you take a set of all vectors anchor at the point that's called the tangent space of the point x, and you decree an inner product. An inner product that will depend on x, y. So you take two vectors, v1 and v2, and the multiplication of v1 by v2. is given by this expression. So I think of a matrix. I convert this expression in a matrix, and I simply, where the coordinates of B1 are A1, A2, and the coordinates of V2 are B1, B2. Of course, to be an inner product, I need this has to be positively definite. It has to be symmetric. It's symmetric automatically. And positively definite by Sylvester, Sylvester rule that we all know in the first year of high school, 
in Russia, <laughs> <laughs> not in Mexico. Mexico maybe for Europe. You, then in this case, uh, well, you require to be positive definite is it, it, it implies that you need e positive. All the minus have to be positive. E positive and the determinant positive. So e g minus f square has to be positive for every x y. So this is a Riemannian metric. It's a is the, is the data of an inner product, point by point, and was without saying that I require that all parameters, everything varies smoothly, or, real, or even real analytic, not to have it, but could be even continuous. And that's what is called a Riemannian matrix. It's a beautiful invention by Carl Friedrich Gauss, and that's very useful because it allows us, I want to cross the boundary, but I don't need a visa. Okay. And that's extremely useful because in that way one can actually construct the length of the length of curves. So you have a smooth curve, or even piecewise smooth <coughs> gamma from an integral a b to omega. Omega is this right region. Then you de you define the length of gamma in, as usual as the integration of the speed. So the length of gamma will be equal to the integral from A to B from the norm, and I explain what it is, of the derivative dt. But this is the norm with respect to the inner product. So it's the norm. So what you see, Euclidean, might be different with this, okay? And so therefore, this is, a, this is a special case of that in which g is 0, the middle coefficient, f is 0, sorry. Only you have dx, dy. You have a mixed term. And furthermore, the two e and g are equal. No? It's a special case. So these are very special cases of metrics for open sets of the plane, which are of the type rho of z, a positive function, times matrix of this type. In other words, a multiple, positive multiple of the standard Euclidean metric. So this is the standard Euclidean metric with the inner product, standard inner product, and this is what is called a conformal metric. Of course, as z is a x plus e y, so let me write like that. And let me write it as a square to emphasize that it's positive. Okay? Well, this is called a conformal matrix, and this matrix is very beautiful because the angles of this matrix, of the, on the in omega, are exactly the angles of the Euclidean matrix. So you use it over two unit vectors, and I put it explicitly like that, so the matrix. Then, the angle, you see, the, you measure the Euclidean angle and it coincides with the Euclidean angle. Um, so, this metric decreases the same angles, but of course it decreases different lengths. That's what is called conformal. And therefore, this is, the, 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 therefore the disk, with, this, with, the, with the poincaré wachevsky metric, is the object of my talk. It's the disk provided with this metric. Now, there's a beautiful theorem. You see, it will take a long time to explain what curvature is. But if the metric is given in a beautiful way, then there's a formula for the curvature. The curvature of z at a point on the plane, at a point in omega, is given by the beautiful formula, rho to the minus 2, the Laplacian of the lower end of rho. The Laplacian is a standard Laplacian. The operator, the elliptic operator, that way. The Laplacian, you know. And so it's a beautiful formula to compute. It's called the conformal curvature. And now, there's a beautiful theorem that is also due to Gauss. It says that if you change the coordinates, you can always choose an appropriate change of coordinates. So that the metric involving E, F, and G becomes 
conformal. This, the, these are the so fam famous isothermal coordinates. And the existence was proven by Gauss himself in the real analytic case, and then in the Hilder case by Carl Lichtenstein. And he goes all the way to Teichmuller to beautiful theorems, you know. And therefore, there's no loss of generality if I give this definition of curvature, you know, conformal curvature is like that. And in particular, for this case of choice, except there's a four. So this is four times the Euclidean metric, but weighted with this function. For this metric, the curvature of the disk at every point is constant equal to minus one. So this, this, uh, this metric, and Poincaré has a beautiful way of describing this in his beautiful books, you know, like Science and Hypothesis. He imagines the disk with a distribution of temperature that decreases as you go to infinity, as you, as you arrive to the boundary. So the circle is the boundary. And, but in our case, we think of it intuitively like your ruler becomes smaller and smaller as you tend to the boundary. So you keep walking and you don't cross the boundary and mm -hmm. fall into the precipice. But you keep, your steps are more, smaller, 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 and never reach the boundary. In other words, that's another way to say it, the metric induced by that is complete. Every Cauchy sequence converges to a point there. So now, this is the introduction. I described what the famous Poincaré disk, and you will see that it's incredibly rich in its structure and incredibly beautiful. It's one of my favorite objects in all mathematics. Because now, consider the following. So it's the disk in the complex plane with that metric. I don't write it three times. Now consider the following expression. Delta of Z1, C1, C2 equal to Z1 minus Z2, 1 minus C1, C2 bar. And now, consider the following transformation from the disk to the disk. T of Z equals T to the I theta, C minus A, 1 minus A bar C. Wait a second because I'm sweating. That's what I mean by. Sorry. Okay. You see that expression? It's a fractional linear transformation. It's the quotient of two linear functions. And here I required theta is a real number, mod, mod 2 pi. Any real number. And the only thing I require is that a is a that one. So this is a holomorphic function in the disk. Of course, it has poles outside the disk. It's a holomorphic function on the disk. So, and it's an easy exercise that it preserves the disk and it's a projection. And its inverse is also this type. So this is exactly the set of all holomorphic maps from the disk to itself, completely characterized, depending on three real parameters. A point with this, two dimension, and real number. So this group, very easy to see, that it acts transitively on the disk. You can go from any point to any other point by a transformation like this, exercise, easy exercise. But also it acts transitively on directions, because you see, if you are in the origin, this contains this particular case, rotations around the origin. Transformation of these types is simply a rotation around the origin. And therefore, you, you, since you can take any point to any other, you take a point, rotate whenever you want, and translate it. So this group acts transitively, it's called, on unit vectors. You can go from any vector, unit vector, to any other vector. So it's what is called a homogeneous manifold. And it's what is called uh, two transitive, two transitive, namely vectors go to vectors. Acts transitively on vectors, you can take it. And therefore, this goes, fits very well 
with the philosophy of Felix Klein, the Erlangen program. Hi, this will be the universe of hyperbolic geometry. We will, in a moment, describe geodesics and describe its geometry, which will be beautiful, because it's exactly a model of non-Euclidean geometry. And non-Euclidean geometry has a beautiful history. It's essentially always Gauss. Gauss discovered it, but never published it. At that time, it was very secretive mathematics. In fact, you know, if you, I recommend you going a little outside of the road, recommend you highly a book by, by Felix Klein, Developing of Mathematics of the 19th Century. And then you can see the characters of the, which of course, for him, the 19th century starts in Germany and with, with, uh, with Gauss. And of course, you kept your secrets. And we owe to Jacobi the existence of the, international, of the ICTP. Of course, that's a joke, but what I mean by that is Jacobi was an open personality. He started to like to talk with everybody, organize conferences, and the notion of that, actually, we own it to Jacobi. And it's a little bit of a joke saying that we owe the ICTP to Jacobi, but there's a little bit of truth that the idea of sharing knowledge was not always universal, and diversity was not always universal. And so this way, so we have, uh, uh, okay, we have this group, and this group has the beautiful following property. If you apply this operation to that expression, this is preserved by the transformation. So this two-variable function is invariant on the transformation of that type. And it's almost like a distance, but it's not quite a distance. Can you see? Can you see? Yeah. OK, so now we become physicists, and we let z1 tend to z2 becomes an infinitesimal. And z1 tends to v2 means this becomes dz squared, and this becomes 1 minus. No, this becomes dz, and this becomes that. And of course, all that, all that you can make rigorous by taking curves. And that implies this simple formula exercise take curves and make that tend to 0. And this implies that this thing is exactly the group of orientation-preserving isometries of the disk with the Poincaré metric, poincaré lobachevsky metric. So now we have a space with a metric. I have defined the metric. So the metric, I define the length of curves. And to define the metric, you do the usual way. You take two points, take the set of all curves, piecewise differentiable curves, that join the two points, and take the infimum of the length. In this case, it won't be necessary because we calculate at this moment precisely the distance between two points. Okay, so. Okay, so now we take the disk and remember geodesics are differentiable curves that minimize locally distances. Okay, so I take the disk and I take. I want to compute a geodesic starting from zero and going along the real axis. So I parameterize it in the, in the obvious way. Uh, alpha of t equal t, where t belongs to you know, zero open one. So I take a curve like that. Now, it's clear by the nature of that, that this curve, that if I go like that, this curve will be have length longer than this one because that this function is radially symmetric. It's invariant on the rotations. And so if I take any other path, I arrive from here to here, let's say from here to R, where R is less than one. So I take a, if I go any other way, I'm bad. So, I go like that. 
So this will be a geodesic, and I only have to be, and, and to compute the, the, the length, I know my formula is, is the parameter is t, varies from 0 to r, and my formula says this. this formula, 2dt, 1 minus t squared. And we know how to integrate that. That's the logarithm for 1 plus r. Use pa partial fractions. No? You just write this like 1 minus t, 1 minus t, over 1 minus r. So this is the explicit formula from the origin to a point in the real axis at a, at a Euclidean distance, r. The Euclidean distance is r, because that's, but the hyperbolic distance is that formula. And now, this group acts properly, acts uh, transitively on, 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 uh, on vectors. And now I, can, I take any point, take a unit vector, and take the unique transformation of the type t that takes that to that, and I computed explicitly all the geodesics with any given initial conditions of unit vector at any given point, just using group theory in the spirit of Felix Klein. And now something beautiful, because this graph, you see this, is actually a Moebius transformation. The general Moebius transformation is of the type, also called hom homography in French, or hom hom homographia in Italiano, and these are transformations of the Riemann sphere of this type. This is A. So this is a special case of that, you know. And there's a beautiful property of transformations of this type in the Riemann sphere. So I, I, I add a point at infinity. It has the beautiful, beautiful property of preserving cross ratio. And the cross ratio of four points in the Riemann sphere is defined the following way. So we have C1, C2, C3, and C4, four points in the extended plane. I do define the cross ratio of these four points, with some exceptions. We see one different problem. You know, it's defined almost every, for almost every quadruple. And this is by definition C1 minus C3, C1 minus C4 product C2 minus C4, C2 minus C3. This is the cross ratio of four points. And Moebius transformations is the first thing of the book by Alfors, the first beautiful thing. Moebius transformations preserve cross ratio. And also in the book by Alfors, I recommend the complex variables you will take. Four points are, co -circle, are, are in a circle, if and only if, the cross ratio is real. Beautiful fact. And when you transformation preserve cross ratios, and therefore send points with positive with, with real cross ratio to points with cross ratio, positive cross ratio, and therefore circles go to circles. If you when you transformations are holomorphic, therefore preserve angles and send circles to circles, are circular. And therefore, because this is a circle, I mean it's a line, but it's a circle of radius infinity. So the inverse, the, and preserve angles. So the image of that geodesic, this is a complete geodesic, will be a circle. And because this angle is straight line, the image of that, the image of that complete geodesic, negative or positive, is our circle, because this is a circle of radius infinity. This image is a circle, and the angle is 90 degrees, and if all its possible images are circles, which beat orthogonally the boundary. Okay, so now I raise the blackboard, and look at this beautiful model. I just want to give one test of what I plan to give us. So we go faster, so therefore, I have now this, it's points and it's geodesics, complete geodesic lines. 
geodesic line, non-parameterized geodesic. And the geodesic line are diameters or circles, actually arcs of circles, which are orthogonal of the boundary. And now I decrete that point is a point in the disk, a line is one of these geodesics. And with this, all the axioms of Euclidean geometry are valid, except for one, the axiom parallels. Because given a line, remember that's my, a line and a point exterior to that line, I can consider infinitely many lines that go to the point and do not touch that one. So it's unlike Euclidean geometry. And that is what makes the difference. And therefore, this is the beautiful property of that. And therefore, you can do geometry. You can do everything. You can actually construct Euclidean, poly Euclidean polygons. You can do triangles. You can compute many things. And actually, there are other models of hyperbolic geometry. And the great British mathematician Cayley, you know, this mathematician that it would be impossible to read their, <laughs> to read their papers because it's, it's like Poincaré, you know, you go to the library of Poincaré. <laughs> if you understand a little bit, that would be good. So Cayley, consider the following transformation. C of Z from the Riemann sphere to the Riemann sphere. C minus I. And this has the beautiful property of, of sending the upper half plane the, point, the points of the type positive imaginary part to the circle, to the disk. So the upper half plane goes to the disk. It's really easy to see because we say. The, if it points in the real line, this is the conjugate of that. Because, because Z is real. And, and, and comp we know by our high school complex variables that a complex number divided by its conjugate is a unit, has unit one, has, has norm one, and then you, I equals to zero, is injective, so that maps the upper half plane to that. And therefore you say, well, why don't? Use that bijection, and that's really a holomorphic map, to transport whatever I know from the disk to the upper half plane. OK, if you do that, you can also pull back the metric. And the metric becomes the Lobachevsky metric, which is the following. It's again, it's again conformal, right? It's a, the, 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 the factor is 1 over y. And that's the Lobachevsky state for the upper half plane. Now, it's provided with a metric of constant negative coverture minus 1. And now, because this is Moebius transformation, circles go to circles. And therefore, these things here become circles, half circles that are orthogonal to the boundary. Excuse me, no, this is not. Uh, I'm glad that I've done a spot because otherwise I will write with my cigarette. Wait. So, and therefore, you see that the geodesics here are vertical rays or circles, of half circles, orthogonal to the boundary. And that's beautiful. You can do geometry like that. And each model, I will show you three models, has its own virtues. This is fantastic to compute areas. Because you see, you see the area form for the Riemannian metric of Gauss. Remember E, F, and G. The area form is this form. Is the determinant of the matrix I wrote. Remember the matrix E, F square root dx dy. So this is the area form of this weighted metric, this Riemannian metric. 
And therefore, for this particular case, the area form is the x dy over y squared. You compute areas in the upper half plane with this beautiful formula using your calculus, you know, courses. And then it's beautiful because I'm going to show you the following beautiful fact. Now you can speak of a, of a regular polygon. A polygon is a convex set. You, you make sense to speak of convexity. A re regular polygon means, or a polygon, not necessarily convex, is a set which is a journal curve which is composed by a final number of geodesic arcs. That's a point. And here, of course, geodesics are the arcs. You know, if you prolong this, this is supposed to be orthogonal. So he, here you have a hyperbolic quadrilateral. And very easy computation, because this you can parameterize in terms of cosines and sines. You know how to parameterize circles. You can easily compute, compute the area. And the area of a polygon, let's say of a convex polygon, P, will be equal to n minus 2, beautiful formula. n is the number, number of sides times pi minus the sum from i equals to 1 to n. So we have n internal angles. So you have 1, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4. So phi 4 minus 2 times the formula. In particular for a triangle, n is equal to 3, 3 sides, 3 angles, and the formula is exactly the area of a triangle. Well, this is a bad choice. Let's call it tau. Is equal to uh, pi minus alpha minus beta minus gamma. Where alpha, beta, and gamma are the interior angles. Beautiful, because it's the opposite of Euclidean geometry. The sum of the angles is never pi. And in fact, it becomes pi only if the triangle is ideal. So it doesn't happen in Euclidean geometry. You can send the vertices to infinity. No? And the area of that will be pi. But as soon as you have vertices inside, the area is strictly less than pi. And you have that. And it's, a, it's a beautiful construction. And now, hyperbolic geometry has some other virtues. Like, for instance, it has I say not a personal notation. Hyperbolic equals complex because I, we, this will join two subjects of mathematics: hyperbolic geometry and complex. But I want to not to forget. So has right angle hexagons. Something that doesn't exist in Euclidean geometry. You have a convex polygon with six sides. And the, interior, and the angles are right angles. Beautiful, huh? Because, I might say, there are many formulas of hyperbolic geometry, the law of sines, the law of cosines, they probably won't have to sign. No? Many formulas, which is, they are worth learning. And these formulas imply the existence of an hexagon, in fact, many hexagons, one, two, three, four, five, six. You see, these are geodesics, not supposed to be circles, arcs of circles orthogonal to the boundary. And these, all these are right angles. Now, by the formula there, the area of that is pi. And now, I become, with this comes the idea, I become a hyperbolic tailor. I learned the word Schneider recently, so I didn't know Schneider was a hyperbolic tailor. So, 
You cut a piece. Now all the material will be hyperbolic. So you take a hexagon. By the way, hyperbolic geometry tells you the following beautiful things. Opposite sides have the same length. So the set of hexagons are in one-to-one -one correspondence with triplets of positive real numbers. So that's one. So suddenly when you go to the Cotillier, you know you say these are my well, you have to do exercise first. These are my this is my size, so A, B, C. And then you take your hyperbolic, so you got code, code your material with sort of a uh, circular scissors and cut one piece like a hexagon. Now take two hexagons of the same sizes and glue the corresponding C with C, A with A, and what you get is beautiful. It's a pair of pants. The boundary is, is geodesics, because you see, if you glue that with that, well, where are the hexagons? Well, one side, second side, one, two, three, four, five. So is it, you see, it's the front part of the pants, no? And the other one, like that. So this part, of, the, of course, they have to be on the, on the same side, otherwise you're going to look like, you know. <laughs> okay, same A, A, A equals A, so you glue two, boom. And of course, you glue that, that, that with that, isometric, you don't wrinkle, no? So you take two hexagons, you glue them with an isometry of the size, you pair with pairs, and you get a pair of pants. Beautiful, no? And with the property that this is, these are orthogonal. Once I have a pair of pants, and I have, I, I have as many as the positive orthogonal, A, B, C. Now, given, now I take two pair of pants of the same sizes, the cuffs, the same cuffs, I don't remember this, it's Centur, in, in, in Mexican, Mexican it's Valencianos, but it's not, it's not universal. So, you take two copies of that, using the hyperbolic tailor, this side is equal to that side, the length of that curve is equal to the length of that, the length of that equal to the length of that, that equal to that, and you glue this, boop, boop, with isometries. And now you have a pretzel, a surface of genus two, but with a beautiful hyperbolic geometry. And you have as many, depends on three parameters, but actually depends on more parameters because you can do that with an and rotate, right? So you have three parameters, A, B, C, and three new parameters, theta one, theta two, theta three, is the rotation you glue. And this rotation is a real number. If you glue, you twist a thousand times, it won't be the same thing as you twist 2,000 times. And so this way, you, pro you obtain that the surface of genus two, the pretzel, has a metric, because everything blew together, with constant negative curvature minus one. And not only that, you have a whole family of them. And in fact, if you have the surface of genus G with G holes, you can show that the space of hyperbolic structure depends on 6G minus 6 parameters. And we are here landing into beautiful subjects of mathematics. This is the theory of modular spaces, ribbon surface, and Teichmuller's theory. Beautiful. It's one of my, I recommend, highly recommend all of you to read the books by Thorston. And I can give you, if you stay, I can give you lots of material. I have thousands of folders that I, some of which I never read, but there's many of them I do read. And therefore, fantastic. Every ribbon surface of genus greater or equal than two, compact, orientable, admits a, a complex structure, uh, sorry, a hyperbolic structure. And now, the group of isometries of the disk and what are the group of isometries of the upper half plane? Are Moebius transformations also of the form T of Z equals AZ plus B over ZC plus D. Where A, you have the matrix ABCD, 
A, B, C, D have to be real, and the determinant one. This group is called PSL2R. So these transformations preserve the upper half plane under the condition that A, B, and C, D be real, and the determinant be different from zero. You can assume that is one. And that means that you are providing a ribbon surface not only with a hyperbolic structure, but actually with a complex structure. Because the changes of coordinates will be uh, isometries, hyperbolic isometries, which are simultaneously holomorphic maps. And therefore, we've shown that every surface, compact surface genus G, we have shown, I mean, I will need, <laughs> I will need two books, but, but with my hands, I have indicated that it's a beautiful way to prove that any Riemann surfaces, orientable smooth Riemann surface of genus G, greater or equal than two, has a complex structure. The case of the torus or the sphere is particular, the case of the elliptic curves, and so this way you have that. So, simply with this formula, you get that. And uh, now, everybody here has, uh, I think most of us, have seen the beautiful pictures by Escher. Everywhere, no? It's one of our, for mathematicians, it's one of our favorite painters. And now, you take the model of the Poincaré disk. And you notice that when z is zero, this is essentially the Euclidean metric. And zero looks like Euclidean metric. So now we take an octa regular octagon here. You don't see it, but so the angles here are very, very, very large. So I I I move the I move the I move the the size of the octagon. It's like a stop sign to three. Here's a regular octagon, no? It's supposed to be regular, okay? And there's one moment when this the, the all the eight vertices go to the boundary. So you have all the angles become zero. One, two, three, five, six, seven. It's regular, <laughs> but and therefore I go from something large to zero, the angles. So at one point, by the intermediate value theorem, I go that the angles are pi over 4. So I take that particular regular octagon. OK, so it's an octagon, like the Escher figures, you see. It's a hyperbolic octagon, with the property that the interior angles are pi over 4. And now I take that, and I tessellate the plane like a mosaic like this. How do I do it? I reflect, because you can do geometry, you can reflect figures. I reflect the octagon by other sides. And there's a beautiful theorem of Poincaré that says if you do that, you will cover the Poincaré disk. And you be careful to paint it black, white, black, white, black, white. And in this way, you get the hyperbolic plane covered by isometric oct regular octagons. And there's a group that acts, that, inter that moves, the, moves the, like the same way you remember the torus you obtain by taking the squares, the tessellation, and translating. It's the same thing here. You have a group that acts, and the quotient gives you a surface of genus 2. Now, you take a 4G gone, regular 4G gone, with a proper interior angle, you can do the same thing. So these are beautiful Riemann surfaces with lots of symmetries, and is part of the work of one of the great, one of my other heroes, Hurwitz. You know, Klein is one, Hurwitz, Riemann, all these names, no? Jacobi, I say Jacobi, fantastic guy who got an idea of, of uh, uh, see, Weierstrass, one of my, my heroes. Weierstrass was my hero because uh, he started his famous theorem of elliptic function when he was 40. 
And when you are that age, you start looking in the dictionary, <laughs> the Wikipedia, to see who, which mathematician still did mathematics after four. You are too young, so you still have four years to go. But you know, I was, <laughs> when I was 40, let's see who, if I'm biased, just fortunately, he was a, I mean, he was a, he, he had a very good life there for well, what do I do? And he discovered the P5, not the P function. That's, don't take that as an example, please, no, but. So, well, in this case, this case you get beautiful tessellations of the plane. And I recommend a book by, by uh, Magnus, Wilhelm Magnus, are tessellations of the hyperbolic plane. And now, what about, uh, well, let's see, I still have, how much I have? 10 minutes? See? 10 minutes, okay, because I, I start a little late. Okay, so I gave two models. I give two more models. So this thing gives you a link between complex variables, arithmetic, because I said the matrix could have arithmetic entries. And now there's another model. So you take, it's the projected model. In that case, you take the following equation. So this equation in R3 is the equation of a, it's a quadric, is an equation of a, a, a cone, right? X, Y, Z. The set of all triples uh, satisfying this is uh, one of the not consider one of the branches of a two of a hyperboloid. So this is the question of a hyperboloid. It looks exactly like so this is a cone and this is a hyper hyperboloid. This is a, hyperbol a, a, a branch of a hyperboloid in R3. And you see, this is actually homeomorphic to the disk. Here, you take the disk at height z equals to 1, and you project radially from the origin. You have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the hyperbola and the points of the disk. No? So it's a, it's, this is a disk embedded in R3 as a branch of a hyperbola of two branches. And now, you introduce a Riemannian metric here. So you want to decrete the length of vectors, the inner product two vectors. Well, you simply do it on a Minkowski. You take the product of two vectors in, in in R3 by this formula. So if this was a one, that would be a standard Euclidean product. But here I put a name. So this is called the, since we are mathematicians, it's the Minkowski metric. If you are a physicist, it's called the Lorentz metric, but it has the same thing. And you take this inner product in R3. And fortunately, the inner product of two vectors could be zero. Exactly on this cone is what is everything goes back, like cone. However, if you take a point here, I take the tangent plane, and you take vectors tangent to that plane, this, this branch of the hyperbola, this inner product, because positive definite. And therefore, it induces a metric in the hyperbola. And guess what? This metric is the hyperbolic metric. So it's an, another, and <coughs> this has another beautiful properties because the group of isometries is the group of Lorentz matrices, namely the matrices that preserve this inner product. So it's the set of all matrices A, so is that AJ, A transpose equals J, and the terminal A equals to one. So take all matrices, that have, this is J, that have this property. These are linear maps of R3 that preserves, preserve this. And you can see that, in fact, this group acts properly transitive, uh, as, sorry, as transitively, and uh, so this is the new geometry, uh, a Felix Klein. It's another model, and there's a, but actually, if you are a little bit more clever, 
instead of looking at R3, you take the space of all lines in R3. And you compactify R3 by adding the plane, the real projective plane at infinity. So it's the space of all lines. And this is the projective is RP2. The real projective plane is the set of all lines. And now you project this figure. So the, the cone becomes a circle. The hyperboloid becomes a disk. You see it's parametrized by, it's parametrized by points of this disk. This, this hyperboloid becomes a circle. This becomes a disk. What's the complement? The Möbius band exercise. And therefore, we have shown en passant that the projective place of them from a disk by gluing a Möbius band. Anyhow, these transformations, can, you can projectivize these linear transformations, non-singular, and therefore sends one parameter, one, one sends lines to lines, and therefore it acts on the space of infinity. And therefore, Felix Klein discovered that the group of projective transformations that preserves a non-singular conic is exactly hyperbolic geometry. And therefore, again, with his Erlangen program, saying geometry is nothing else than the study of invariant properties of the group action. And therefore, the Poincaré disk has many interpretations, can take you from all the way from hyperbolic geometry to number theory, I mean, modular forms. Like here we have here Professor Zagui, a case. But you can create modular forms. It's a fantastic subject, which I invite you to. It's a very, very basic notion that goes all the way to the most modern mathematics. Like the proof of Fermat's theorem depends highly on the Poincaré disk. And last but not least, what about three dimensions? So in three dimensions, you take the disk it's in R3 with the metric, with this I finish. Metric dx squared, the same one, but one more variable. Four, one minus a squared plus y squared plus c squared squared. And this is the model of hyper. So if you take all, and then we do the, remember the trick of using an, a regular octagon, octagon and inflating it onto the angles? Now you do the following. You take a to the cathedral with 12 pentagonal faces here. So I'm gonna. <laughs> you don't believe me, but it has 12 pentagonal hyperbolic faces. And then you start inflating it. Until you have a regular to the cathedral space, so that the dihedral angles, the angle between two faces, becomes 90 degrees. And then you play the Escher Poincaré game. You reflect, 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 and you have an Escher in dimension three. And you can do that. And therefore, that way is the way that Cypher and Weber, Cypher Swiss, Weber, I think, I think the two are Swiss, discovered a beautiful manifold dimension three. But the game doesn't stop here. The game is that the arrival of another genius of my, of my generation, younger, slightly younger than me in, in terms of age, but William P. Thorston, together with Pancare, and William P. P. Thorson shows that almost every three-dimensional manifold, in the sense of all those to be clarified, is a hyperbolic manifold. Or, at least, is a piece of a hyperbolic manifold, as was shown by Perelman, and that takes you to this Pancare disk that started like a model of non-Euclidean geometry, essentially by Boliai, Lobachevsky and Gauss, and Beltrami, never forget Giri Beltrami, becomes a fundamental object in all of mathematics. And I think the moral of the story is study, go to every seminar, even if it's not your subject, learn everything and intermingle every subject with every subject, because you will gain with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Everyone is welcome eh, to ask questions. Come in. I'm not sure I can answer it, but I tried to. <laughs> it was so clear that there, were, there won't be any questions. <laughs> there wasn't a, a big question. So uh -huh. 
in these three models that you present here, the disc, the Poincaré disc, the... The, the projective, the projective, the Poincaré disc, the, the upper half plane, the upper half plane, the... What the, was the, the first one? The what? The first one, in the history. Ah, the first one was, was uh, the disc. The I disc? Think. I think the disc. I think was what was the plane, because then you know they are isomorphic, no? What's the plane? Mm -hmm. Essentially, Beltrami gave the formula For the disc. like that one. So, yes. and uh, the, the rest were essentially pictures. Mm -hmm. So, as such, as a complete Riemannian matrix, I think Beltrami, and includes all the mess, all all of them. And uh, a, well, actually, Hilbert, I recommend also Hilbert to observe the following. The metric actually can be given in terms of the logarithm of cross ratio. Very simple formula. And Hilbert abstracted that. The beautiful theory, which is actually current research, you know, eh? because it's a, you, take, you take any complex any complex set of the plane. Not necessarily, let me write it, not, not, not polygon, but. Take any convex set of the plane, bounded convex set of the plane. And taking I will give you a distance. You have to show that it's a distance. That's what Hilbert shows. You take two points, x1, a, b, throw the line, and you have x, y. So by convexity, this line intersects a two point the boundary. And then you take the logarithm of uh, the distance of x minus a, x minus b, y minus b, y minus a. Exercise by Hilbert, <laughs> this uh, distance is a complete distance on any convex set. So any convex set has a natural, any convex set on the plane has a natural metric, which is called the Hilbert metric. It's very rich. Um, in fact, Garrett Birkhoff, the son of David Birkhoff, proved the perron frobenius theorem using this metric. It has very lots of useful things. In fact, with this hyperbolic geometry by Gromov, etc. And this metric also is hyperbolic? Okay. This metric also is hyperbolic? No, it's a beautiful question. Question, when is it for the disk? It's hyperbolic. What about an ellipse? Mm -hmm. Also for an ellipse. That's because projective geometry can take you from a, from a conic to another. But if I give you a uh, horrible convex set, no. And it's actually a, an open question to characterize the Hilbert matrix that correspond to hyperbolic matrix. So. More questions? So, See, yeah? Oh. I'm sorry, okay. So you said that if I take the pants and I twist one of the... I cannot hear well. I'm, is it, can you speak louder? Sure. So, when you draw the example of the pants. Ah, see. Yes. The pair of pants? Uh, pair of pants yeah. That one? Yes, yeah, so you glued two of them. Why? Excuse me? You glued two of them. Yeah, you glued two. I, I glued two hexagons. The front part and the lower uh, and, the, and the back part. Yes, so you said that if you twist, two th 1,000 is different from twisting 2,000. Oh, okay. Okay. I cannot hear very well, I apologize. Come, no. come here, baby. Well, fine. <laughs> I come here. No. Okay. Sorry, I'm going for just one second. <laughs> right. So you said if you twist 1,000 times different from twisting 2,000 yeah, yeah. times. So I just asked, how, Why? How, how do you know you twist? Because I thought, I mean, if you could show us and you twist. Actually, yeah, you see, one turn, two turns would be the same thing. Yeah. A, a very good question. This is the first thing I say. Why 2,000? Because, very good question. Why? It's not the same thing if I turn one an integer number of times, no? It's a very good question. I tell and it's slightly non-trivial. You see, because okay, one invariant of these hyperbolic surfaces is the length of their geodesics. It's very important. Now, if I go turning one, suppose I have a curve that means transversely here. If I turn many times, the length changes. You change the length. But I have a friend, Dennis Oliver, that tells you, imagine you, have, you, are, you are, imagine you are a plumber. 
okay? You have these tubes for water, okay? And you glue it to connect for your house, something, I don't know. Here, it looks like you do the same thing, no? You turn. But here, if you take this curve and turn many times, you change the length. Think, think, you can do the same thing with a torus. Take a cylinder and, and, and do it with a piece of paper. And if you go 2 pi plus epsilon, it's not the same. If you go four times, it's not the same thing as you go two times. So it's like because the length of the geodesic, transverse geodesic changes. It's like I, in fact, rotate the bundle. Como, como? It's like I have a, it's like I have, a, I rotate, uh, I mean, okay, so topologically there's no difference, right? But it's like I attach a bundle and then I rotate the, the connection I have. Uh -huh. And then that's why they're not. That's as here. Yeah. yeah, but essentially it means, yeah, my, my way of explaining is the simplest way. If you do that, you change the length of geodesic. It's an operation that changes. This is called the length of spectrum. It's an invariant of, a, of any Riemannian manifold. And, uh, but it's a good exercise to see why. If you do it with a tessellation, you'll see the immediately why not. Okay, so let, thanks again to our speaker. Thank you. 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 Thank